Sports Show presents House of Rugby. Hello and you're all very welcome to House of Rugby. My name is Maura Trasny Rule and joining me in studio this week are Lindsay Peat and Johnny Murphy. What a weekend of Six Nations action. Heartache for Ireland, of course, but Andy Farrell's men are still in pole position to claim the championship. Lindsay, Johnny, how are we both doing? Johnny, you were playing the Legends game on Friday. How's the body after that? Uh, yeah, still <laughs> still struggling a bit, to be honest. Um, I don't know whether that's self-inflicted or because of the game, but uh, yeah, it was great fun. Uh, you know, for someone like me, I went over there, it was what, 10 or 11 Leicester lads playing, so it was great to catch up with, with old friends and then guys like Danny Barnes and Billy Holland and those guys that would have played in Munster with. So yeah, it was a good weekend, but this is this is a slow week, I can say. I can <laughs> Still a bit that. dehydrated, I'd imagine. Yeah, yeah, definitely, <laughs> definitely. But yeah, all all for uh, for great char- for uh, two great charities, and uh, yeah, worth putting your body to that once a year, just just for the fun of it all. Did you do much prep in the build up? Uh, no, no. <laughs> I ran around with uh, the club side on Thursday night for about ten minutes in skills, just to make sure that I could actually still catch a ball, and that was about it. So yeah, very very under under prepared, but it was good fun. <laughs> Looking back at the game. On Saturday, Lindsay, this one still hurts, doesn't it? It feels like the quarterfinal defeat again. How are you feeling a few days on? I'm probably still angry. <laughs> I'm angry because, not because of the loss, really, because we didn't, when we did decide to put phases together, like, you know, they, we did get tries out of them, but we, it was just too few and far between those those uh, those moments for Ireland. We were very out of out of character, out of sync, and I have to give it to England. We spoke about them being a potential banana skin. If everything that they were trying to do and had spoken about clicked, uh, they were going to be a very dangerous outfit. And I think finally we saw this attack that they're they're looking mm. to play. I was very, very impressed with how they kept the ball alive, their running lines, their support lines. Um, and really, as much as I'm angry, I think it would be a very unfair result, which kills me to say, uh, if England didn't come out on the winning side, because they certainly were the team who played all the rugby. Yeah, that's it. In England, we're underdogs going into this game. Now, the Grand Slam dream is over for Ireland and we're feeling very hurt by that. But as Lindsay said, it would have been robbery, really, if Ireland had won in the end, because across the 80 minutes, England were fierce and they really put it up to Ireland in the physical stakes from from the very first minute. Uh, yeah, and I think they probably, you know, we saw a glimpse of, of, of how they wanted to play in that Scotland game in the first kind of 10, 15 minutes. Um, on Saturday, unfortunately for us, they put an 80 minute performance together. Um, huge amount of emotional drivers in it, obviously with, you know, uh, Jamie George, you know, his first home international um, since his mother passed away, Danny care um, and then you know was alluded to in a number of uh, interviews after in the press conferences about what was being said about them in the press and you know they used that and and they really did stand up you know their selection with the likes of kind of you know George George Martin who's a you know who's a mountain of a man and then Chesham at six kind of allowed them to go after their line out a bit more um, and physically they just they were they were on it. They were on the edge. Um, you know, a lot of people, even though they don't like using the word violence, but they were in most collisions. They were they were really violent in that area, and they pushed the boundaries and they kept pushing it. Um, and they were they were good value for it. I think the most frustrating thing from an Irish perspective is that, you know, we get two points up with you know two minutes to go and we can't close the game out. I think that's. And there's a number of factors associated mm-hmm. as to why that happened, but I think that's probably the biggest frustration that you know really great sides win when they don't play that well. And Ireland had the opportunity to do that on Saturday, but they just didn't didn't close it out. Is this a problem looking at the bigger picture that Ireland are underperforming in these big high pressure games? Well. Yeah, to build on, on Johnny's point there, like England actually threw that ag- away just before we had the opportunity and, and won the ball back out. Like Danny Kerr put in a little grubber mm. and you're like, well, you just had a line break from Marcus Smith. Why the hell would you do that? You're actually now in our 22. And this was a stat that fascinated me. Out of the two teams out of the championship, the highest entries into the 22 were both Ireland and and England. However, Ireland's return from visits to the 22 and the opposition brought lots of tries, whereas England were actually not, not scoring from their visits. So, like... That was the naivety of England and I thought then, you know, um, when they took that shot uh, with Ireland's in discipline again, they kind of threw the game away. So, yeah, we it was a time for us to like not play well, but like manage the game that it wasn't our responsibility now. We'd gotten out of jail and when we took, when we put phase together and took the opportunities, we were good for that, that lead at that time. 
But then I just do not get the box kicked. Like at that mm. moment, we were actually down in Balancolic and we're in, in their dress, in their, excuse me, their clubhouse. And I'm roaring at Teddy going, no, because like I'm not a back, but I'm like, why not just put the ball up your jumper? This is the time now we really slow down, go through your phases and just wait till 80 minutes and kick the ball out. Now, it's easy for me to say, but actually that was a consistent theme for Ireland that every time that there was big decisions to be made, we faltered under the pressure like really quick passes into this just killer channel or killer running line and we turn the ball over. Uh, Ill-discipline at times and actually when we slow the ball down and put phase together, we made England very few times now but we made them look mediocre. Do you know, when we were able to get it out wide and score good tries but they were easy enough tries once we put phases together but we just didn't do that initially and I think, yes, for me it comes down to uh, you can't replicate that pressure in training so then when it comes to test games where is the plan? Like where is the game plan? I know nothing really went our way I mean two two HIAs that, you know, both um, Calvin Ash and, and Frawley failed but like I thought Gibson Park actually was one of the standout players, especially when he went to the wing, like his his catches under the high ball when he was under pressure was ex- exemplary, to be honest. So we did have moments where we should have just got ourselves over the line, to be honest. Well, talking about those final moments again, Johnny, what should and could have Ireland done differently? Do you agree with Lindsay that they shouldn't have taken the box kick or yeah. how would you play out those final uh, moments? I think, in my opinion, I think, yeah, I, I think you're going to struggle to play out for two minutes there because the referees are really hot on side entry or anything, and you're only two points up. I think the the kick is okay, but I don't. For me, I think the mall is the is the start off. You know, the line out had had steadied itself when Keller came on. Um, you know, Henderson obviously had come on, and the calls had been been good, and we were 100 percent when when Keller was on the pitch. I think a big thing there is why not mall and see what happens then. Try and eke out a penalty. Um, or just control the clock a bit more um, but playing off the tail uh, you know that was a bit of a, 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 a I didn't understand that so obviously Doris is uh, at 9 he goes up but then Baird plays to Conan in the middle of the park you're in your own 22 don't understand why, why they would have played that and then when you get inside the 15 don't really want to be box kicking there. You probably can go back to your 10 who's got a bit more of an angle, a bit more time on the ball. I know you're back 10 metres, but you'd hope from that area Crowley can land the ball on the halfway um, or you run kick to to Lowe's left foot. But for me, I think, why not maul the ball there? Um, try and get a penalty, but you're controlling the clock. You have probably 10, 15, 20 seconds, then make decisions off that. Um, that was the kind of thing for me. Um, I think the kick, I personally think you have to kick the ball there just the way the referees are at the moment. They know you're was going to be closing Was it a collective in. decision to do that? Did that come from the well, box? It's a fa- well, it's a phase call, you know, that, that is being called by by your 10 there, you know, in the setup, the line out is called. It's a five man, five plus one um, uh, line out where Doris goes into lift and the ball is in the air. They play to the middle of the park. Well, they play inside the 15 it's not really correct use of your angles there and they didn't even really have that long a rook either to give Murray an opportunity to take another step and go further um, and then the collective D off that mall off that line out on the 10 metre within two phases they're on our 5 metre line like that's again that's something that they're going to dissect and look at I don't think that's that's not good enough and not what you expect from an Irish side in terms of where their D has been for the duration of this uh, this tournament, I think oh, that's what do you put that down to? Is that fatigue at that point in the game? Yeah, well, talking to some guys that were at it and some the and looking at different kind of reviews of it, they seemingly the view from people who were on ground level there was that they looked a small bit, you know, gassed at that stage, um, and that you know even in their kick chase, their kick chase was off. Um, their discipline again was in the last in the second half was off again that can be down to fatigue or or just because of the intensity of the game that has been played at such a, a high pace that they were just struggling to get their lungs in gear um, that's from people that were at the match but uh, I, it's very hard to gauge that when you're mm-hmm. looking at it on TV Yeah the loose kicks the handling errors the missed tackles we're not used to seeing these from Ireland do you credit England for that pressure or was it an underperformance? for a lot of our players 
Uh, just to, to on the back of that point, I don't think the one moment, by the way, of the box kick of Conor Murray was more so of 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 winning it. But I think he'd had put up a couple of box kicks that had put us under pressure. And mm. I think one thing in England did well because there's not a lot of territory. And, and John makes a great point. But rule of thumb: you would line out mall. Mm. You would try and get, get a bit of gain line, and then you're making good angles for mm. either one hit up and a better angle for depending on the the what foot your kicker mm. is. But what England did very well off our, our our kicks was just their their attacking line off it. They just picked gaps. They were able to gain momentum. And to be honest, I think it was 34 minutes gone, and Ireland had 10 missed tackles. Probably most, probably in the run up to that championship. It's just not something we're used to. So the fact that England were winning gain line, they were picking soft shoulders. They were like I thought Bernard Earls was absolutely yeah. unbelievable. He he grabbed England by the scruff of the neck when you thought, oh Ireland are finally after turning a corner. Do you know our like third and fourth quarters of games are a really strong point and you know it's 44 minutes gone and we're finally you know after going ahead so he just dragged them back in so they were just they were just brilliant in everything they did and they were probably unlucky with a couple of turnovers actually yeah. against us they were they were penalised for a midfield turnover which I actually thought was legit so um, they just had their homework done on us but we nobody stood up for us I felt like I thought Bundy stood out uh, Gibson Park stood out but again uh, actually one thing that was really mind blown was the speed of ruck from England uh, Alex Mitchell was absolutely excellent in the first half other than the first three minutes England took over then and they looked like the t- like the Irish team who'd been playing <laughs> yeah. up to that championship Um so we were just very much out of sorts we didn't know how to respond to a lot of a lot, a lot of pressure Um we we didn't negate that line speed that actually England brought. Uh, now there was times where we made excellent decisions from our tries, where you know there was a shooter from the line. We held onto the ball, we attacked that space that was created, and then we were able to create like an overlap, whether it be a three and two or a four and three. So there was times we were glimpses of excellence, but yeah, missed tackles, uh, losing the gain line. Um, they'd certainly given away a couple of scrum penalties mm. at key times, and they certainly targeted our line out, and they were just more physical and. Um, as I said, I, they, they look like the team that brought the energy and the hunger, unfortunately. I think one thing on, on what you said around the uh, counter-attack is like when you analyse the game, the centres work great. Excellent, weren't they? Unbelievable when the, when the kick went in. And, you know, the fundamental thing around kick cha- around um, you know kick receive and counter attack is the people off the ball are probably more responsible than the people on the ball so it was very clear that all the you know there's the kick receive the guy who's receiving the kick all he had to do was worry about collecting the ball uh, all the work rate and and the communication off the ball there was off the charts for England mm-hmm. and that's something that um, you know that doesn't cost like that that's not talent. That's just that's a talentless task. It's just work rate back into position, communicate when you're under when you're under duress and your lungs are, are screaming at you. So why didn't we, we did see that time. work rate that we're used to seeing from Ireland on Saturday? Well, I just think you have to credit England for the amount of pressure that they put on, how they started, you know, and then Ireland you know, despite all that, they still got themselves in a position to win the game. You know, so the claw, they did claw their, their yeah. way back into it. Um, but, you know, I think, again, I have to credit a lot to Felix. We've spoken about him before. Like, there was probably no better coach in the world to have on the sideline at the weekend because since the World Cup draw, Felix has been reviewing Ireland every game. Like, he mm-hmm. must have hours and hours and hours of data and footage on them so like he had a he has a clear blueprint of how you know Ireland you know can struggle or what areas you want to go after and he brought that wealth of knowledge with you know to the to the whole team this weekend um but yeah it was just they were just on it you know they they mm-hmm. really really were um and there was a like the a lot of things like the people that were there said the atmosphere was incredible you know, a couple of weeks ago they were being booed. Like, so, yeah. you know, there's all these little things that are just massive energy drivers that when you're tired, you can, like, the atmosphere will drive you on more. You'll you'll forget about your lung burning where it's very hard when you're under pressure and you're under, you know, physical duress that when the crowd is on top of you as well, there's very little driver that you can take from that to to, to, to get on. But yeah, England, we're just, we're just very good. Even the yellow card. 
that was a huge sign of pressure. Yeah. We actually didn't need to get off our feet, you know. Yeah. O'Mahony, and it just happened to be O'Mahony. He did a great job in getting back for that break off Earls. Um, got over but then just sealed the rook and it, and of course it was cynical because England were on the front foot yeah. so it was just like every moment we were put under pressure we, we our decision making at times at key times just succumbed to that pressure and mm. it was like no one had an answer and you can understand some players having that an off day because it's a very pressurised environment they're very like the French now mm. uh, the English they can really create that atmosphere when things are going well for them but like um yeah, it was very unusual for a team to have nobody really stand up other than, as I said, uh, really Bundy. Like, no one else kind of stood up. They were just silly, uncharacteristic errors. And again, it's just pressure. And when you're like when you're being attacked in such a violent way, yeah. um, mm. you're physically then absolutely being put on your ass, being put on your back foot. So the brain just doesn't work under pressure then, you know, because you're so, you're so fatigued. Fans and pundits, Irish and across the water, we're very confident of an Irish win going into that. Could there have been a bit of arrogance and could have that have seeped into the players' mindset as well heading into this game? Because you're saying that all the players were a bit off. There were mental lapses. There were mental lapses, but you never know. Like a test game is different to every... Every test match is different. The opposition is different. The environment is different. The stack going into that is no Irish team or English team had won consecutively on four occasions. They'd only ever reached three. So nothing was, you know... Now stats are stats and they're there for, to be broken, but it's it's very unusual. Um, and I suppose considering the form and, and how Ireland were in and, and they were very, very clinical in all the performances, though not really probably far and at 100 percent, they still on paper and I still would, you know, they should have won that game. They could have won that game with and even not. They were probably at 50 percent of even. So now I think, look, all those handling errors like I think there was 24 handling errors I'm open for question that in the Scotland game alone like so any team coming off the back of that where they are creating chances but they're not making them and they're uncharacteristic errors or they're actually basic errors for professional players you're like they're just not sinking here and that could have been easy England again if we had to put them under pressure but I thought they're running lines as I said even for the Furbank try just I told you how quickly his hands was it's been a long time since mm. we saw the mobile uh skillful Mario and told Jay, you know, able to kind of showcase exactly what he can do. And we were waiting, you know, there was a lot of chat even from this show here, you know, we were waiting for England to just really back up what they said. And unfortunately, uh, it came yeah, at the wrong it. time for us to click. You know, yeah. that two week break probably suited them. Mm -hmm. They had no pressure. And I, I, I do remember saying, I think if anything was to motivate this back to back, back to back Grand Slam, it was actually going to be England to really, you know, derail Ireland. And, and that's what they did. And they did their homework. And I remember, um, the, the turnover in midfield, even though it was a penalty against England, um, Ellis Genge, uh, I think it was Femi yeah. Rosova, was yeah, it? Yeah. Um, he took him and he said, no, that you know, that's not it. Sam Underhill backed that up as well. Very calm, but they were like, that's not the game plan. Yeah. And I was like, that's a turning point because there was such clarity that we hadn't seen before on both sides of the ball from England. Mm. And look, I can't fault them. Um, I just thought their speed of everything they did, it was so clinical, their running lines, and they just, at times, were not used to it. They tore Ireland apart and... As I said, every test game, you never know where you're at. And that was a different pressure for Ireland. That was more of a game management. It was and it put their skill set and their game plan really under pressure. And we unfortunately had no plan B. And that just happens. Yeah, they scored three tries. Not many teams come up against Ireland and score three tries. And as Lindsay said, they had some really clever interlink interlinking play, mm. which we hadn't seen from them up until this point. So how did they manage to stretch Ireland? Um, I think they actually, they, they played in, in uh, attackingly a very similar way to how Ireland play. Um, and with that, you know, Lindsay's already said their speed of rook ball in terms of their, you know, rook entry, all that. They were killing any kind of threat we had around the ball very quickly um, and then little things kind of went against us you know obviously the Nash injury with the split um, where you're going a 6-2 split to probably trying to negate the power of what mm. England have um, and then you know there's a foot and touch for one of the things and refer the touch just doesn't see it that's fine that's part of it there's all these little things that just keep adding up and um, those they add up to a collective big thing in terms of a loss but I think the 
for me, they decided to play. They backed themselves to play. Their shapes are really good off nine. Um, you know, they very similar kind of a three and a two in the middle of the park. But their aggressiveness in the carry, their uh, footwork just before contact, little subtle, subtleties around. You've already mentioned Atoje. He's lined up to run a hard line there, and then he just controls his feet last minute, and then he's able to get the pass away. It's all that stuff that they've obviously been working on, felt it's been coming, um, and they put it in fits and starts, but not collectively. Then they're just the emotional drivers that they had had all week, but they were they were very, very good. Um, and they just made a decision, we're going to go out, we're going to play. Where a lot of people thought, and a lot of people were talking about last week, that if they wanted to really kind of stay with Ireland, that they were going to have to maul, kick, maul, yeah. kick, power, just round the corner, kick the ball, build the pressure, accept what's coming back. Where they didn't, they met fire with fire and they went out to play. And... Uh, that's what all the main guys like Furbank he's doing it week in week out with um, um, with Northampton um, you know winger Mabosa he's going out he's playing week in like Exeter and they're being guided all these younger guys are being guided by play by coaches that want to play so Rob Baxter you know Sam Vesti in Northampton all those Northampton lads they play every week they go out they play and they yeah. keep playing you know Mitchell at nine was excellent Quinns they play a really good brand of rugby um, Lawrence then and Slade yeah, in the midfield Slade, were you know, like back. they were you know again they just had really good balance across their their play and you know I suppose with the way the guys play in their club you're pushing an open door there when you decide to go out and play because they're used to they're used to doing it week mm. in week out Onto the 6-2 split. It had worked well for Ireland up until this point. Now, in hindsight, it's all well and good to say, oh, we should have gone for the 5-3. Will they reassess what they're doing with regards to the bench going forward now? I think it'll change week in, week out. So I think it's easy to sit here and say the 6-2 split. It was a good decision and it still what it still will be a good decision. I mean, um, when Chesham went to, to, the, to the back row um, and they brought in... Oh, Martin. George Martin yeah, yeah George Martin in the second row who's an absolute I thought he was exceptional because he just brought again that just that extra power um, and he was able to win gain line and again he brought that aggression on the defensive side of the ball so like they were really really clinical and even their decision making in England they made three changes and you were kind of questioning okay we've only made one um, so should we have made the changes sooner no I mean you can't uh, I don't know what have uh, Calvin Nash he, he actually made a really good read and it was just like he stopped and took the contact instead mm. of driving through the contract. Um, and then I thought maybe you could give me your opinion on this. The scramble, I thought maybe um, Crowley should have committed earlier because he had the sideline with Lawrence and then he would have had his, his, his players coming over from from the open side to help him in case he came back in. So it just, I suppose at times when we were put under such pressure so quickly, that's where our clarity actually just seemed to go out the window, which is very hard because when things are just happening so quick at speed and that's again where England put the pressure on us, it's very hard. You're really making split second decisions mm. and if your timing is off, which I felt it was slightly was, I don't know why we were so, the ball just moved so quick and we hadn't got the numbers around so we were just caught short. Um, but back to Johnny's point, their, their work rate from England, even Atoje happened to, to, to stop his feet for that particular, for the Furbank try. But there was other times where I watched England and actually they had this one off runner to kind mm. of stop Ireland's defence. And that was something I haven't seen from the England over the last couple of years. Their work rate from their centres coming back for, for their kick receipt, uh, how they ran their running lines, which is really actually a thankless job. But it's so efficient in just holding the, the, the defence and keeping Ireland narrow because they got their all their tries from like well except for the, mm. the Earls one but you know they were they were the Lawrence try and the Furbank try got us out wide which we're not again used to you know um, as regards Nash it's unfortunate it's double unfortunate when Frawley goes back because he, he wasn't too bad when he came on um, but we have the players there I think it's never going to happen it was just were they a bit disjointed because they had to make that change early on it's yeah I would think it just probably hit them a bit early and they hadn't even settled into the game so it's never it's never easy to lose so, someone so quick so but again it's a little blip it, it shouldn't have impacted us we started off well I still think we could have maybe settled maybe little decisions but as I said it's easy to sit here now and I just think everything went for England and clicked and unfortunately we just had a really off day in everything that happened discipline where we gave away penalties trying to force the ball We had spoken about discipline in the build up to the game it has been an issue for Ireland at times in this competition as well is it something that we're seeing more of is it a continuous issue do you think? 
Well, it brought his head up again against England, and again, it's just our decisions under pressure. Um, we're not used to probably seeing it from Ireland. They're so disciplined on the defensive side of the ball, very like Leinster. They just they really trust in their defensive policy and systems. They make those double tackles and they wait until the right time to pounce. Josh Van der was the other the other man. I thought actually I couldn't remember. I was like someone else stood out for me. I thought he was brilliant and his decision making at when to go for the turnover was exceptional. But other times we kind of forced the ball. Um, Ty Byrne had an unbelievable read on our five meter to to the ball was out and he just stole it, but. I think England would have scored if he hadn't made that decision. So it's it's a theme of the championship. It's been consistent and it's something I think if we're... I can see us come out all guns blazing now against Scotland. This is going to be really skin hair flying because I think we're coming in with two teams who have a point to prove mm-hmm. and a lot of pride to salvage. Um, but it's certainly a thing I think we need to eradicate uh, for this weekend coming. Another theme has been the line out and we've spoken about it again and again. Now they won 11 out of 13 line outs but they were under pressure and they weren't winning them cleanly. Is this something that can be rectified or is it an ongoing issue? I think it is. Um, but I think you have to, again, you have to credit England and then their selection. So you're playing, uh, you know, you're playing Ollie, Ozzy Chesham at six, which ele- which means yeah, you have three, locks, lo- have three locks, essentially. Um, so their line out then, you know, they have three jumpers. Um, and like even when you're in a five man line out, all three guys, they're all in the line out. So and they're quick enough and agile enough to move. And like even for the last last line out where it's a five man and it's a the Doris joins like that was really tight like they got they had nearly two pods up Mm. there and they just held on to it so like they did put Ireland under a lot of competitive pressure Um, the return is okay but probably not what what they want it was just the amount of jumpers and options they had Um, now Pete's obviously an excellent line out forward in terms of at six so you just have to manage manage that and look at probably varying, varying it up but they still it is something that they're continually working on but you know the first two or three games first two games we were talking about how good it was and that's the difference so it's just the last two games probably they've but maybe um, they've they weren't questioned. under pressure with like, yeah, regards to the line out in the first two yeah, games yeah I don't think they probably were you know France they look at the size of the guys. Uh, they're probably not as agile as um, you know Wales and and um, and England are. Um, but you know, I'd imagine that it's something that you know they w- they will get right. And it's great for me. I think it adds it puts probably pressure within selection there for guys. So concentrates the mind. And then a good thing is you know when Keller c- come off the bench, you know he's been very very good off the bench. Um, he's a hundred percent. Well, he had sixteen out. Yeah, uh, yeah, he? yeah. He's been really like, and he was rock solid again this weekend. And he got a lot of flack for for the World Cup. So like he's you know that's you know we've two really really good hookers there. Um, but it is something that they're going to have to look at, and they're looking at. I say they're looking at a number of things this week. You know, this week yeah. in training. But even defensively, like we have to give England credit. Like I was mind blown that like Jamie George gave a little um, uh, front ball to to Dan Cole, and mm. they just decided. So that's again, like Ireland weren't even set. They're kind of waiting for this jumper to go up, and and England just again just off script. Like mm. this is not something we've seen yeah. before from England. They did another little trick play. I yeah. think just before that tight turn on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, like they were, Ireland were very lucky off. That actually, very lucky yeah, it was a great tackle and yeah. I was, so they had a 1-3-1 a one, one, yeah, if yeah. memory serves me right so what that happens is they're waiting for this you look think this mm. middle pod's going up or there's a trick play or some movement and next of all they just skip the front lifter and intro this gap yeah. and I'm like yeah. part of me was like applauding them going yes England didn't yeah. expect that and the other part of me is like wow they're here to play yeah. and we just weren't ready so I think we're under pressure on both sides of the ball because England really tore up the orthodox scripts and said nah you won't even know what we're bringing today and Look, I hate saying it. They are the old enemy. They've you, they have dismantled our historic chances of of back to back grand slams, but they were well worthy of their win. Like I mean, we could go through from here to the rest of the show. I think bringing up exactly what they brought to the table uh, at the weekend, and and they should be very proud because they've come in for a lot, a lot of stack. And I know yeah. you're just waiting for them. Um, to put this performance together and hopefully they'll do it again against France and, and it won't be just a flash in the pan. Yeah, is this a turning point for English rugby now and how do they back it up against France away from home? Yeah, I think it has to be a turning point. Um, you know, um, Lindsay's already said it, it, like it can't be a flash in the pan. They've set the standard of what's there. They have a younger side now. They can really catapult themselves into... Um, 
you know, into a force within the Six Nations. Um, you know, France are struggling a bit. They clearly have a proper World Cup hangover. You even look at the dynamic of the bench when the camera pan to them. Um, you know, over the, like Edwards and Galtier, they usually sit beside each other. They're at polar ends of the box this weekend. <laughs> so, like, there is a, but you know, England need to back it up. And then people can start, you know, other than that, then, you know, they're obviously getting, you know, they are using, you know, how pundits and everyone has been speaking about them over the last number of weeks. But to, you know, to say that's wrong, they have to back up a performance mm -hmm. and they have to go on a summer tour and they have to play well and do it consistently week in, week out. A lot of those players are doing it consistently, are doing it consistently week in, week out for their clubs. So, you know, I think you'll, you'll see another really, really good performance um, this week and from them. And I think that's a good thing. It's, you know, we need... The competition. Yeah, we this. need, we need you know, England firing. We need really good, you know, we need um, the, the English slides firing in Europe. It's good for the game. And um, I think, you know, this weekend, hopefully Netflix were given all access to both Italy and, and, and England and we can really see what it was like. <laughs> and hopefully they have a camera at halftime <laughs> on Steve Bortwick and Andy Farrell and yeah. we'll find out what was said there. <laughs> well, Rob Kearney was speaking as Virgin Media Television celebrates Mega March, their biggest month ever of live sport with the Guinness Six Nations Championship, the Republic of Ireland International Friendlies, Cheltenham Festival and much more. And Enda had a chance to catch up with him yesterday to get his reaction to Ireland's defeat at the weekend and how that changes things for Ireland ahead of the visit of Scotland. Disappointing, first and foremost, isn't it? Um, back to back Grand Slams are, are very hard to do. Uh, and this was a, a step towards a golden opportunity for one. Um, you know, I think in the cold light of day, we, we, didn't, we didn't really perform on the day. Our, our pack got out muscled by a very good England pack. Our discipline was poor, and that's not something you associate with this Irish team. Um, and you know we didn't create too many opportunities and you know you have to credit england as well they were they were very good on the day um, they they had a good game plan in terms of how to get at ireland they didn't kick as much ball as we've seen from them before they knew they had to score tries if they wanted to win uh, and you know the character that they showed to get back into the game and to win it with 90 seconds on the clock um, was was very impressive was it a, a little bit like the Wales game where Ireland just didn't really get going? They were still better than Wales, so they got over the line. Whereas this England side are obviously working a lot on uh, their defence. Uh, they've obviously got a really good Irish coach within there. So, I mean, it seemed to be that Ireland just didn't get going in this game at all and England just swallowed them up. Yeah, they did. And, you know, I think in the Wales game, they, they didn't get going, but they always knew that, they were the better team and you know I think when you go in at half time with a 14 point lead without having to do a huge amount you know there, there is sometimes a danger that you might think that it's a foregone conclusion you just turn up for the second half and things will be okay um, you know I, I wouldn't say that that was the case this time against England you know particularly you're away from home against England it's always a hard game to win so you know I, I don't think that you know, I don't think that there was an element of complacency from the team. They just didn't get out of the blocks. And, and as each minute goes on and England stay more and more in the game, their belief starts to grow tenfold. And, um, you know, it was just it was one of those days where the opposition made it made it hard. Is it one of those where it's almost like it's a different experience for the fans because I guess the fans' mindsets are always like, well, Ireland are dominating here, they're going to win the Grand Slam, England aren't really up to much, whereas the Irish mindset wouldn't have been that really. So what I'm trying to ask is, I guess, are the fans more shocked by this than what the players would be? No, I think the players would be pretty shocked by it too, um, but they'll also be very realistic in terms of if we don't turn up and if we don't play the standard of rugby that we're capable of. If there's any team in the world on their given day that can beat us, um, you know, I think there there has been definitely an air of complacency within the country over the last few weeks. You know, more from a supporter, press, media, that sort of cohort, as opposed to actually inside the team. Um, but you know, it's it, it's a lesson learned for everyone that you know one one bad game and and there's a lot of teams out there who can turn us over.
There's a few themes from the Six Nations. One, I guess, is the 6-2 split. Like, was it a mistake from Andy Farrell to go with a 6-2 split, or was that sort of he just he backed himself and that's what he does? Um, but then you just get unlucky with the, the Nash injury. You know, things happen within a game that you can't legislate for. So was the 6-2 split in this occasion a, a mistake from Andy Farrell? No, I don't, it wasn't a mistake, and, and it's never going to be a mistake, you know, because you only know the the true benefit of your selection post game, and, and every game is different. So, you know, Andy Farrell is going to do more six two split again uh, in his coaching tenure, and sometimes it works, and other times it doesn't. And when the times it does work, it thinks you know everyone thinks it's great, and and there's times that. Having six forwards on a bench can can win you a game when when they come on and bring a new level of physicality and, and energy and, and whatnot. So, listen, there's, there's going to be times when your bench selection strategy does come under pressure, and when you lose, you know, one of your backs five minutes into the game, straight away you're on the back foot with it. So, you know, there's there's always arguments for and against it, and you know, it's one of those perfect moments where hindsight's 2020 20 after a game. Another one has been Ireland's discipline. I mean, we have given away a, a whole heap of penalties um, and it's been sort of in clunks as well. We've been giving away penalties, you know, five or six in a row in small periods within the game. We sort of got punished for that again at the end of the game. I know, you know, England didn't really need the penalty in the end, but they would have come back and they probably would have kicked the winning uh, score anyway. So in terms of Ireland's discipline, did that come back to bite them in this game? Yeah, it, it did. It was, it was one of the main reasons that we lost the game. Um, our discipline was poor, and it's not something that we associate with this team. I think our disciplinary record is probably, if not the best in the world. We're very good in that department. We don't normally get get yellow cards. Um, but when the opposition puts you under pressure in a game, you're forced to make decisions and you're forced to um, do things that you might not normally do if you're not under pressure. And we don't see this team under pressure that much. And that's what good good opposition teams do to you. And, and that's, that's the aim of the game, is to put the team you're playing against under as much pressure as you can and force them into bad decision making, particularly around the breakdown. So, you know, there was, there was penalties, and particularly in, in that last you know, few phases of, of play, um, we gave them outs and, you know, it's, it's, it's a hell of a lot easier attacking a team's goal line when you have penalty advantage because you know you can be a little bit braver, you can throw that pass, um, knowing that if it is knocked on or an intercept or something happens that you do have that uh, fallback of coming back to the penalty. Was Conor Murray's decision to box kick the right one, do you think? Oh, well, listen, we, again, these are one of the things in hindsight you can you can have loads of debate about. These three options. You, you hold on to the ball for 90 seconds and try and play out of your own half. Referees are hot in that area if they see you trying to kill the clock and, and you know, play down 90 seconds. They'll be looking for infringements at the breakdown. Guys going off their feet, ceiling, anything. So, you know, I think the decision to kick was the right decision um, you know would it have been better to, to kick it 50 or 60 metres down the middle of the field get a really strong kick chase and, and then get England to work out of their own half it's a lot harder to score from, from 60 metres out than it is for 30 metres but at the same time you know you give them a, a penalty on, on your 10 metre line you'll still back your defensive strategy and, and capabilities enough to hold them out um, and they ran a very good line out uh, got to the edge quickly put us under pressure um, and then a couple of poor decision making uh, defensive errors in that in that phase of play just allowed them to get closer and closer and when you're 10 meters out um, you know you start making some silly mistakes and decisions that you might not normally just looking ahead to next week then could have been wrapped up this week. It makes it a lot more uh, difficult, a lot different of a proposition. What sort of mindset do you think Ireland will be going into this game now against Scotland? Because, I mean, there is a bit of bite between Ireland and Scotland anyway. So it really uh, it is heating up for the final game. Yeah, it's a very different proposition, isn't it? If you're going for a grand slam, um, 
listen, there'd be, there'd be a small seed of doubt in their heads after what England did to them last week, and Scotland are probably the one team you don't want coming to Dublin because they have no fear of playing against us. They will throw the kitchen sink at us, and, and Finn Russell will will thrive in that environment where every play is, is almost a free play to them. But, you know, they'll mood will be low in camp today, they'll review the game, they'll try and take their learnings, but I think deep down they'll still know that if they play to what they're capable of, they will win the game. And that's, you know, it's always a, a great position to be in as a team, knowing that, you know, you're better on the opposition on your day. You just have to bring that out. And just finally, on Scotland, like, you would have played against them several times. There seems to be sort of this feeling within the Scots, within the fans, and seems to be within the players as well, that Ireland are a little bit arrogant going into this fixture at times. Like, do you find that? Do you think Ireland are overconfident at times? Or do you think maybe Scotland just haven't turned up on the occasion at times? Yes, I think to, there's, there's lots to unpack there and that. You know, we've beaten Scotland, I think, 10 out of the last 10 occasions. So, you know, we are a better team than Scotland. Um, and I firmly believe that this weekend will be no different. If, if we play to what we're capable of playing, we will beat them. Um, you know, but like you say, the, the Scottish sort of always feel that maybe they should be at our level a little bit more. Um, and, and they can be because they can play some very good rugby and they can attack really well and their back line is, is very, very good. But you know, in, in the cold light of day, if this team performs to what they're capable of and how they have been doing over the last few years, they'll beat Scotland. Well, Lindsay, are we arrogant? Well, is it when the stats speak for themselves? Nine out of ten wins? I mean, know? I know. We do have a great record against Scotland. Yeah, and there's a lot of talk from them. Uh, no, I think they're... I suppose they're so similar to ourselves, aren't they? We always love playing the Scots. There's always a bit of crack, but... Yeah, it's funny. I find it um, offensive when people say Irish people are arrogant because I don't think it's a tag we normally get. So we just seem to. A enjoy. lot of people thought we were very arrogant going into this weekend as well. I think it's a, we're dreamers, aren't we? That's the difference. We are dreamers. And when we get close to something, we're like, oh, my God, we're such a small nation. Like we are well punching above our weight. So uh, personally, I'll defend our nation because I don't think it's arrogance. <laughs> I think it's very much excitement and pride. And sometimes we actually don't know how to handle that. We're either one end of the spectrum yeah, or the other, know. you know. Don't mention the elephant in the room or then we tend to dream over and beyond. So, uh, look, we're, we've had an exceptional season. We're an exceptional team. We don't become a bad team overnight. I think it will add a little bit of pressure now considering the, the Scots are calling us arrogant. So I think they will bring a lot of, they would have said it in their documentary. I know Stuart Hogg mentioned it, you know, we owe them one. They probably owe us a few now at this stage. So considering they started the upsets of the weekend against Italy, um, followed by our own against England. I think they'll come to, to Dublin with fairly something to prove and really want mm -hmm. to um, pour on our celebrations for Patrick's weekend. But they better not. They no. better not. We have loads of plans this weekend. I should mention that Johnny had to run off. Um, he was just so upset after the defeat. He just couldn't take it anymore. He couldn't talk about it anymore. <laughs> but looking ahead to the championship and what's there for the taking, here's how the table stands. Ireland are on 16 points. England are next on 12 points. France, Scotland are on 11 and can still technically win the championship. Um, but the points difference probably makes it impossible but a win or a draw will win it for Ireland and if Ireland lose but get a bonus point they'll win the championship which wouldn't be ideal we don't want that scenario No and I think it would be a little bit catastrophic now at this stage to just be the team to bounce back after the, our World Cup heartache it was always going to be a tough World Cup you know when everything had to align we really did ourselves proud in the group stages which we hadn't really performed before so lots of positives to take out of it Probably again, just a little slightly underperformed at times, but, the, but we didn't really underperform. It's it's just those small margins, and that's exactly what happened in the quarter final. So I think we need to regather. I think there'll be lots of reviews, lots of reassurance that again we just don't become a bad team. There's the pressure we a little bit faltered under, and any any player, any athlete in any realm of of the sporting world, it's happened. It's happened to individuals. It's happened mm -hmm. to teams. And you just it's about now the bounce back. It's about reminding it. this world uh, how good this team is, not for us, not for the fans. But if I was that player in that dressing room and I've been there before, you, you collectively come together and make decision as a team because you've done yourselves individually and collectively in injustice. It's nothing to do with anyone else. This is about this team, Andy Farrell and everything they've gone through. So 
I would think they'd be very motivated to to put things right for themselves, regardless of anything that's said outside that book. Well, Andy Farrell was saying they've become very good at winning. Now they need to become very good at losing as well. And he was taking it all in his stride. And no doubt they'll be fully focused on this weekend. And it, it said that you learn more from your defeats than you do from your, the wins. So what will their main focus be, having looked at Scotland in the championship so far? I think they're actually as indisciplined at times they have been indisciplined. They're they're well able to like they they lost their way against Italy even though they were in probably a commanding position and, and should have won the game. And that's not to, to devalue or dilute uh, Italy's win. They've been really exceptional through this championship. They've really lightened the place up after a dismal World Cup. So I think they can be petulant. They're they're unpredictable. But that's the thing about Scotland. They normally talk a good talk and I mean this in the nicest way they can back that up at times but they're they're fairly inconsistent so I think they will now see a wounded in their eyes see a wounded Ireland that will maybe be a little bit vulnerable um, try to put us under the same pressure but I think if we can again just we could probably see a, um, reverting back to a, a 5-3 split I wouldn't see as much pressure on having a, a bigger pack or, or to match physicality they're, they're physical they'll bring a fight but I think um, we could probably go back to a 5-3 I wouldn't be surprised uh, reverting back to that Um and then it's just keeping Mr. Finn Russell right and make sure we don't make mistakes for Van der Merwe, who's, who's the top try scorer, mm. if I'm not mistaken, at this t- point. Um, and yeah, him so he's on top, James Lowe is second. Yeah. yeah. So I just think we were, as I said, we still managed, even though we weren't really at the races on Saturday, I think we still show glimpses of our class, like our two tries. Yeah, what were the positives for you out of that game? When we put our phases together, when we built phases, like some of the passing under pressure was absolutely sublime and it really just caught England open and then the finishes by James Lowe so the, the same thing he was uncharacteristic in say England's first try in when we exited normally he'd kick like he the longest kick the match in 53 metres if, if I'm not mistaken so when we get that right and we push teams back away from our, our red zone or our 5 metre then we're able to re, regather recoup uh, set our defensive line again and we know our policies and we have clarity and we're able to get some breathing space to just calm what's the next thing we have to do get ready for that and we execute it so execution at times let us down it wasn't that we didn't create chances there was just key moments where unfortunately execution let us down poor decision making uncharacteristic clearance of kicks put us under pressure and again that might happen against lesser teams who don't you, you're not kind of punished for that but England decided that they were, and they, as I said, they they punished us well. Like they they played very very well at times. Um, so you don't think we did anything wrong tactically against England? That it was all down to execution. I think we made some poor, yeah, we made some poor decisions under pressure. But I mean, that's all in the in the game. Um, not ideal the changes we had to make. So I think again, we're just going to have to strip it back. We have to get our line out right. We can't be giving away penalties at scrum time. Um, we have to be absolutely clean as as a whistle now in in certain areas as regards our discipline. It's okay giving away um, a penalty in you know pa- in the other opposition's half. Not ideal because you're obviously have to gain in territory to get in there, but that's okay because you're not under pressure then. You know and you know vulnerable or susceptible to to being scored against. So um, it's just getting back to the basics and the the game plan that we've we've done. It it did kind of get out the window. It was. At times we didn't know what we were doing, but at times we did put the phases together, which was few and far between. We still could have won that match. You know, there were still chances and moments mm. we just didn't take. What will we see team selection wise if Calvin Nash is out? We're not, we're not too sure about himself and Frawley. Will we see Jordan Larmer come in? Do you expect to see Gary Ringrose in the team? Yeah, I definitely. Well, because again, we've seen Ringrose on the wing, haven't we? So he's definitely an option to come back in. Um, he was very unlucky not to be in. It's it's so weird the selection now to to see Gary Ringrose, who would have been a, a like once he's fit, he was definitely in a team. Mm-hmm. You know, he's normally starting. Um, so I think we would see him at the weekend. I think Jordan Larmer has absolutely earned his opportunity. Um, so if there's a chance, I would like to to see him come in because he's been flying again for Leinster and he's he's really, I mean, if he's given open ground, he has. And I think there's been change in him where he's still working, like he's pumping his legs. He's making sure he's not just flopping and he's getting a turnover because he's so quick. Normally, this your support for clearing rooks um, are so far behind. But um, look, I think 
though lads that we've mentioned there haven't gotten lo- a lot of game time over the championship I think there's still a huge calibre of player that can do a job if they come in against Scotland What about the pack they've been a few calls for Peter O'Mahony to be dropped and Ryan Baird in that would be very harsh for the captain to be dropped for the final game do you think Baird has earned his right to start or will he keep changes to a minimum for this game I don't think we need to like panic now and just make you know I think Andy Farrell will go by whoever is performing in training on the back of the feet you would hope everyone's coming hungry to train and with a point to prove and that's where things can be fairly positive um, and they seem a, a very good group who are very much um, and you would hope that that's where they're galvanised that you know when things are under pressure and it's a feat that they go off like the rooms take some space but they come back very positive with each other but that there's a there's a bite there that they're pushing each other for for that jersey. So I think it'd be very harsh on Peter O'Mahony to to just be dropped. I don't think there was many standout performances perform, performers that took the game to England, and it was just an off day for everybody. Um, I could probably see him starting, but then depending on how things go, maybe Ryan, Ryan Baird might get on a little bit sooner because the the thing with the yellow card as well, it was such a pivotal time of the yes. game. It really really killed us. If it had been just before, just after half time, perfect. But like within the last 20 minutes of a game to have your captain gone for half of that, it just put us under so mm-hmm. much pressure, added to the fatigue because you're working so much harder. Um, and I then think just England kind of smelt a bit of blood there um, and, and went even more so for us, you know. So um, no, I don't think there's any need to panic and I don't see Andy Farrell doing that either. He's a very loyal man. He's a very pragmatic and rational man. So I don't see him just throwing his toys out of the pram and, and making huge amount of changes. Has there been an overreaction, do you think, maybe us included as well, to this loss? Um, yeah, there's been a lot of chat and I suppose myself, I thought, uh, I did see kind of a 10, 15 point win, but not an easy win. Like I was very clear on that because I thought in that third and fourth quarter, if we could really grind England down, then our bench would come off fresh legged as they have done and really put the game to bed and open teams up. It didn't, plan out that way losses are fantastic I've had more losses than I've had wins and it's been a steep learning curve and I think they do reveal the character beneath they do reveal maybe flaws that you may not have seen against lesser teams and I think if the homework is done this week with what is our Achilles here where might Scotland look to to punish us I think then they'll just shut up shop and and make sure that they're just keyed in to to exactly what the claim, game plan is and refocus on the clarity of, of execution or policy and what the game plan is for, for this opposition. Producer Enda has just said that there's been an underreaction. He doesn't think we're harsh enough. Jesus, and for a <laughs> Donny Gall man, just because they're coming out of Division 2 winners, huh? Um, look, I don't think you can't. It's very harsh. Like, there'd be a huge expectation. And, and at the end of the day, there are players there's game plans the things that go are absolutely out of your control on the day and unfortunately no player in a green jersey could has a magic wand nor does Andy Farrell to to control those things so um, geez end his heart anyway <laughs> we send him into camp but look it's not ideal I'm still angry and you're kind of look you're kind of thinking back that game was in a two minute winning mar- you know we were two minutes from a win That that's how you're, how close we were even though we didn't deserve it but um, yeah we're not infallible it's it's kind of the quarterfinal all over again and that's it are there a lot of parallels yeah I think defeat? we need to learn how to to win dirty to win under pressure to perform under pressure not that see performance isn't that you're cutting teams open with this absolutely magic line break performance is that you're winning the collision you're winning the battles you're winning the game line you're looking after your rook you're winning your set piece and you're not giving away 10 plus penalties you mm. cannot be in double figures for penalties you cannot being double figures for missed tackles. Um, so those things are not about skill. Those things are about just bringing the fight. And when the pressure gets gets tough, we have to be able to just win those very, very fine margins. And if that's play by play by play, it's a very long 80 minutes when it's a performance like that. But that's that's what has to be done if we want to be world champions. You and know? the championship is still there for the taking this weekend. And that can't be sniffed at either. No, because, you know, Look, Grand Slams are, are few and far between winning, but also championships and what revenue it will bring. And there's a whole bigger picture with that. And I said to you down in Kilkenny a couple of weeks ago, you see all these young young people, both boys and girls out playing rugby. And it's, it's, it is key. Johnny said it before he left. It is key to the sport. Um, those upsets, those, it keeps it exciting. 
both for this, both for the supporters and for the players. As a neutral, it was a brilliant weekend. It was a brilliant test match. Um, it was a brilliant weekend of rugby, and hopefully, there's more shocks this weekend, but just not in uh, the Aviva. <laughs> Final word, so Lindsay, there's a lot of niggle between Scotland and Ireland. How do you see it playing out this weekend? Ah, uh, Paddy's weekend. Listen, fighting Irish. I think we'll bounce back. That's what I hope to see. Is that the just the pride and the passion, the weekend that's in it, the final game to cement our championship, to know all that's in stake and to finally have, to, to put it to Scotland again, that we are the superior team and and to show it and put in an 80 minute performance and get the win. I think, again, I think Scotland will come with a lot of lot of energy, a lot of hope. But yeah, I see the, the men in green coming out on the right side. Well, we'll leave it there for today's show. My thanks to Lindsay and to Johnny. We have a mountain of coverage coming your way this week ahead of the final weekend of the Six Nations. We'll be at the press conferences. Pat McCarry will be chatting to Mac Hansen and we'll be reviewing all the action on next week's show. Until then, from all of us here, Slonga Fold. Sports Show presents House of Rugby.